this morning. Yeah, Once yeah. again, it's always enjoyable to be here, and the drive is just amazing. On how in traffic's road. Yeah, yeah, there's a bird or two and everything in the way. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm so glad to be here. And this morning, our text is going to be in John chapter 15. If you want to be turning your Bible there. And it's going to be focused on all the verses, but it's going to be, the, when you get there, we're going to read verse 11, and then we're going to go back to verse 1, and whoever wants to read can read a couple of verses until we read all of it. But I want to look at a subject this morning that's found in verse 11. These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you. <clears throat> And that your joy might be full. Your joy. When you look at that word joy, that's exactly what it means. Joyful. Rejoice. Happy. That's what that word means. And now, when we think of that, and we think of the world today, and how the world views joy, then we see a whole different thing about how the world views joy as what we're going to read in these, in these verses here in chapter 15. Somebody, if you want to, read the first two verses of chapter 15. Or I can call on people if that's what you'd rather me do. Uh, okay, go ahead and start it right there. <coughs> I am the true vine, and my father is a vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. So we see in these two verses, you go to verse 11, and it, it says that this joy may remain in you, and then in verse 1 it says, I am the true vine. I am the true vine. And my father is the husband, or the vine dresser. I mean, when you got New King James? New King James. Yeah, okay. Vine dresser. That's maybe easier for us to understand than husband. A husband in the Bible is someone that takes care of, yeah. of, of the olive oil and the vines and things like that. And then it says, every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Well, automatically... If you bear not fruit and you take away the joy that's supposed to remain in you in verse 11 is gone. It's never there. So we see going into these verses and we're going to continue to read that these are the things that he, in verse 11 it says, These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you. Well, if you don't do these things, if you're not of the true vine, if you have left it, if you don't bear no fruit, there's no real joy in you. The world sees joy as something superficial, as something magical, as you find it in, in, in superficial things. And that's not where you find the true joy that God is talking about here, that Jesus said. Go ahead and read the next two. Someone. I'll get one. Okay. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. So you can't have grapes without a grapevine. Can't do it. You can't have joy without the things that's being spoken of here. You, it's, just, it's, just not, it's just not possible to do that. And except you abide in the vine, no more can you except you abide in me. So if you abide in Christ, then you abide in that vine, which is the true vine, and God takes care of it. That's where you have to be. When, when we hear of the superficial joy that's offered through the denominational world a lot of times, they say, you know, that, that, that you're just so happy. You know, you just have the Lord come in your life, and that's it. You're, 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 you're there. That's a superficial that's not in the true vine. That's not one of the branches. And what's it say going to happen to them in the end? They're going to be gathered up. They're going to be cast into the fire because they are not of the true vine. They don't have the true joy that is being talked about in there. Go ahead and read the next two. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, abides, bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they get them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. 
So when we go back to verse 1, I am the true vine. That in itself, when a statement is that made, just like the one church, everything else is cast into the fire. It's gathered up and it's cast into the fire. If you are not of the true vine, and there's only one true vine, and there they speak of this when, when it says there in verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. Oh, 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 oh. That's where all these other churches come into play. That's where they claim that it doesn't matter. Look, we're a branch of the true vine. You're not a branch of the true vine. There's only one church. There's only one true vine, and that's the vine that God offers us. And he offers us this one church through his precious son, Jesus Christ. In Matthew 16, 18, it, it tells us that I will build many churches to have my name. That's not what it says, is it? What's it say, Brother Gary? My turn, singular, singular, not plural, singular. So there's just one in Ephesians 4, beginning at verse 4 and going through the next couple of verses or three verses. talks about one body. And then you go into Colossians chapter 1, and it tells us that what is the body? The body is Jesus Christ. It's his body, his church, which is my church, it says. There's just only one. And it's the same thing with this vine. It's a, it, it is a true vine. And we are branches of it, each one of us. And what does it tell each one of us that we have to do? Produce. We have to produce. We have to bear fruit. Or what's going to happen? We're going to be gathered up, and we're going to be cast into that fire. So it's not just a simple thing. This joy is not such a simple thing. Is yeah, I know, I invited him in my heart. And boy, I love my brothers and sisters. You know, golly, gee, bum, they're just such a good bunch of people. And we're so happy. That's not what it's talking about. This joy is something that you have to, you have to study. It, it, it's, it's a cause and effect. You know, you got a, a toothache. Everybody in here probably had a toothache sometime or another in life. Well, the cause is a toothache. What's the effect? It hurts the whole body. Pain. Pain. Pain is the effect. And it's the same thing with joy. We must study hard and be faithful and continue, and it tells us to continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We have to continue to do that if we are going to have the true joy that is being talked about here in this verse. Go ahead and read the next two. Verse 5. My words abide in you. Ye shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, and ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. So shall ye be my disciples if you bear much fruit. <laughs> if you go to verse 2, every branch in me that beareth not fruit, you taketh away. And every branch that bareth fruit, he purges it that it may bring forth more fruit. He purges it. He makes it clean. He increases it. And as we study and we grow in the grace of our Lord and Savior, that's what we do. And we learn how to bear more fruit. I don't know if anybody's ever food with a grapevine bearing bush, but you've got to cut them critters back every now and then. Apple trees, the same thing. Peach, whatever. You've got to cut them back a little bit. And they get stronger stronger and that's why sometimes when people talk about the church and, and what the church needs to do a lot of times when we get into church discipline I just don't have a lot to do but it's the true joy that when we get into church discipline we must cut someone back for them to thank and we do that because of love we do it because of love because it's going to make them stronger not because we're trying to lord over them or we're trying to be better than them or anything like that, but it's just like a fruit tree. It had to be cut back. Oh, but it's so pretty and the leaves are so tall up there and everything like that, but I don't know why they don't fruit this year. Fruit would be about that big, but it needs to be that big. I mean, that's why they do it. That's exactly right. And that's the same thing with the with with, with why he purges, while we purge, while we continue to study. So our fruit will be huge and the church will grow instead of just having this real pretty place that people come to every now and then, but there's no true vine in it. There's no true word in it. 
And it's hard in today's world. I understand that it is very hard to do some of these things, but it's some of the things that must be done. There, 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 there's no, no getting over it. And we know that joy, where does it come from? We've been, we've been reading some of these verses. A lot of people think that you can pray for joy, that there's a big old pie up in heaven, and it's the joy pie. And you pray to the Lord, and boy, he'll whack you off a piece of that pie, and he'll send it on down the line to you, and you'll have all the joy you want. That's not it. He's gave us our pie. It's these words right here. He's gave us what we need to have the joy and keep it abiding in us. And it's the word of God. If you love me, keep my commandments. And it's the same thing we're going to read here in this next. Somebody read the next to you here. I've been over in Ephesians. Oh. Verse 9. Verse 9. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If you keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. Okay. How did Jesus abide in his love? Why did God on two separate cases say, This is my Son, in whom I am well pleased? Every instance, every instance that Jesus was tempted of Satan, that he was tempted of the Pharisees and the scribes, every place that we see this, he answered with Scripture. He didn't answer himself. He didn't have no words. He answered with his father's words. He told him, he said, I've not come for me. I've come to complete, to finish. One of some of the first reports, the first reported words. But Jesus said, he told his mama, he said, don't you know i got to be about my father's, father's business? And that's what he was the whole time. He never took it upon himself to make himself of any way besides his father's son. And, and we as Christians of the Lord's Church, faithful Christians, that's what we need to do. We, don't, we, we never need to take on ourselves that we're it. You know, we, we've been in church long enough, we know it and Boy, we got it. Now, that's when you're losing it, when you start thinking that. We've got to continue every single day. Continue. I was reading some information and, and stuff on this, and there is a trick in India, it, it, and it's called the, the mango tree. And they take a mango seed, <laughs> and they put it in the ground, and they say these chants and these special magical words over it, and five minutes later, there's a whole mango bush there with full broke mango. Well, nobody believes that. It's a tree. And that's the same thing that the denominations use when they bring these joy and this happiness to these people. It's an illusion. It's not real. There's nothing. Some people have not sown the seeds of joy. And if joy was to hit them square in the face, there would be a branch for it to hang on. Well, what, what they have is on the surface. It's not deep. No roots. It's not, it's no not roots. roots. Yeah. And they would not be any branch for that joy to hang on. Yeah. You have to make your branches sturdy with that purge, with that cutting back, before that joy the Lord offers and God offers can hang on you, before you can actually be a part of that. Anybody, any of us knows that mango is a tree. Anybody here ever planted corn? I know my brother Dallas planted a lot of corn. I hear about it when it comes up, when it gets so big and he fertilizes it and it gets a little bit bigger. And we know the process. You plant a squash plant, you don't walk up there the next day and pick a squash or anything else. And it's the same way with, you know, over in, a, in a Galatians, it tells us about, in I believe chapter 5, around 22, about the fruit of the Spirit. And joy, happiness, that, that is part of that Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit. But we know from gardening and from other things in our lives, developing a lasting, faithful relationship with someone. It doesn't just pop out of the Cracker Jack box and it's, it's that way. You strive and you build on it. It's the same way with, with this happiness, this joy that's being talked about here. You have to build it. And the way you do that is through study of God's Word. Being faithful. Being the one there to help and to do it is just, it doesn't happen miraculously as the world offers it today. Here, take this pill. Be joyful. Be happy. 
do something special. Listen to a song. Oh, that song brought me so much joy. You may have enjoyed the song, but it didn't bring you the kind of joy that's been talked about here. The true joy from the true vine, from God Himself, the one that can only, only offer it in no other terms besides that. We don't believe that that mango bush just popped up there with it. We know that it did not do that. It takes time to grow it and to, and to stay with it and to be the one that is there. And now in, the, in chapter 15, it talks about this joy, and we've read that. The last verse, these things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you. You cannot learn of it and leave it and still have that joy. You have to remain in it. You have to, it's a continuous action. You have to remain there. Because if you think you can just, that it might remain in you, but you turn your back on it, it's not going to remain in you. The world will replace it. There's no question. The world re will replace it. We, we're adults. I, we, sin's pleasurable. It, it, they make it that way. You ever seen a uh, whiskey commercial or a beer commercial with ugly people on it? Well, they the prettiest people in the, you know, come on. They go out and I guess that's one of the things on the, on the, the, their, the request. You've got to be pretty. But now they don't show the morning after. They don't show about 2 o'clock in the morning when you visit an ivory person. They, they don't show none of that stuff. And that's the same thing that the world offers with their joy. Even though they say, none of that. What are you talking about, preacher? We're not talking about drinking or anything like that. We're talking, we're talking about being in the church together and loving one another and, and, and all this fellowship that we do and this big steeple that we put on top, these stained glass windows. And that's, that's true joy. When you walk in there, you just get, ooh, it just goes all over you, you know. You, you just get giddy. That's not the joy the Lord wants us to have. The Lord wants us to have the joy because we love His words. Because we keep His commandments. And I know it seems like the Church of Christ and the preachers that preach in the Church of Christ faithfully, they are continuously, all the time, going about saying these things about obedience, about following God's Word. I, I, I just tell you, I told, I, there's no way that a faithful gospel preacher can say anything else, but you have to be in obedience with God's Word. It does not matter what you think makes you happy. It don't matter. You can think anything you want to makes you happy. People think it all the time. Some of them astronauts think they're happy when they go out in outer space and look back down on us. That's not. That's a physical, top happiness. That's not a deep root happiness. On that day, on that day when the Lord calls you home and you go and you stand in judgment, and you get taken to torment like the rich man in Luke chapter 16. You think you're going to have joy? He wasn't happy. You think you're going to be happy? No, he wasn't happy. Well, what's the one thing he wanted to do above everything else? He wanted somebody to go back and tell those that he loved not to come to this place. How important is it for us to continue, no matter how they don't want to hear it, no matter how they look at you, no matter they may not come back around you for a couple of weeks or so, that'll wire off, they'll come on back, usually, if they love you anyway. We've got to tell them. We have to continue to tell them. I know I've talked to some denomination, and they say, you know, one of the reasons why I can't come to the Lord's church is because the preachers in the Lord's church is all the time telling us that we have to obey something. That we have, you know, I'm a grown man. Hmm. I, I, I visited an uh, individual that had been coming to church for a while, and he had quit, him and his wife quit, and I went and visited him. I stayed, I stayed, I guess, an hour and a half or so with him. Me and Kathy did talk to him. And it finally boiled down, and the man looked at me, and he said, nobody is going to tell me how to worship. Mm -hmm. And I said, not even God in the Bible? He said, nobody. He said, the Holy Spirit guides me where I need to be and how I need to think. I said, separately, he said, the 
Holy Spirit guides me. See, that's the mindset. If you get right down to it and you just keep on, I kept, I kept picking that scab, you know, <laughs> till, till, till it finally come off. And then he finally told me. I said, nobody going to tell me. And that was the whole thing. Because I had been in the pulpit and I had gave lessons and everything that said, you must be here every Sunday. You must read. You must study. You must follow the commandments. We have to do these things. That's what we have to do. And then one must what? One must believe. Romans 10, 17. Faith comes <coughs> here, hearing by the word of God. What does it say here in verse 3, chapter 15? Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken to you. What word did he speak? What word did Jesus speak? Always God's word. And you're made clean through that. So if we follow these words, when we go through the, the, the actions, the process that these words take us, we're going to be clean too. Because we are going to develop that faith. And we're going to repent. We're going to confess. And then we're a proper candidate to get in the water and have our sins remitted. This is, this is where we're made clean. Not through belief. You, you, Paul was in Damascus for three days. And he prayed. It says it right there in, in chapter 9. Right in Acts. And he prayed for three days. But Ananias, he had done been told, you go to Damascus, you'll be told what thou must do. So then Ananias was spoke to, and he said, you go and you tell him what he must do. What was the first thing Paul did? Saul. He was baptized. Acts 22, 16 tells us what? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. That's the things we must do. And they get so aggravated, so tore up because someone is telling them that they must do something. You know, one of the worst things you can do in America today is tell somebody they have to do something. You know, don't be out in the street right and burning these places. That's not, oh, I'm going to go out there and do it. You know, oh, I'm so mad because they done that to that fella and they treated you like that. I got this color TV. I'm going to take it home, but I'm mad. It's just another excuse Amen. to be out and be right and just, just, just to do something wrong. You know, it, it, it's just an excuse. The vine in the east is the eastern symbol of joy. It was its fruit that made glad the heart of man. When you take it like that, now the eastern symbol of joy was the true vine, was the vine. The vine, the grapevine. Now, I wonder why they thought it made the heart of man glad. What comes out of the grape? Wine. Wine. When you get enough of that alcoholic wine in you, what gets what gets real happy first? Your heart, don't it? Yeehaw! I never thought like this. You know, whoa, I'm happy today. You know, but it's it's a fake, just like drinking alcohol takes the edge off. I, I, I've talked to so many people about drinking alcohol and they say, well, you know, when I get home, I want that toddy. You know, I can just, I can just have that toddy when I come in. Boy, it just relaxes me right on out, you know? Ain't nothing like that. Pick a Bible up, read some verses. See if that won't take the stress out of you. Well, just like, you know, you've been talking about in, in John and that, but in Ephesians where it says the one body, the one spirit, the one but before that, it says, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring. That means keep pressing, keep striving, to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Then go down to 13, it says, till we all come into unity again. You've got to have, just like the branches, even though up and down the valley and on the mountaintops and whatever, there is just that one vine. But we have to be connected to that vine. We have the unity of what? Forbearing, love, study, praying, uh, uh, assembling, doing doing our reading, walking in that light. You can't dabble in the world. You gotta you gotta follow God's plan, His standard. That's exactly right. That, that, that's exactly right. And that's why in Ephesians chapter two, I mean uh, Philippians in chapter two. It tells us at verse 2, it says, Fulfill ye my joy, Amen. that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Now, when you look at that, I'll go to another. But when you look at being of one accord and of one, one mind, the denominations says a lot of them will agree, excuse me, 
a lot of them agrees that the Hindus, that the Muslims, that, that, that the Buddhists, all of those people are sincere and they're doing it their way so they're saved too. But then, you know, when, when they say that, how can they be of one chord when it says if you don't have Christ, you don't have any hope of being saved? Because it says, doesn't it say there's not another name under heaven where one might be saved? Well, if Buddha, I never read Jesus called Buddha. Y'all read it any time? You ever read it anywhere in their world? They have the word Muslim? Islamic? No. But yet they say those people are on the right track too. So how can they say that they're saved and the Bible says something different? And then they say, well, you know, we're of one accord. But yet when the when the first Southern Baptists have, have their convention and the International Church of God have their convention, they have completely different agendas. They have completely different agendas. But they accept one another but are they of one accord? Like Brother Gary said a minute ago, they in the valley on top of the mountains. All these churches of Christ, we have one vine. That's the Bible, the true word of God. We're branches of that. But we have to be faithful branches. We have to teach the word of God faithfully or we're no good. We're just going to be cut off and cast aside. You can have a, you can have a, sign that says Church of Christ, Texas, or whatever, but it's what you do inside according to this standard makes you a, a servant, a follower, you know, and Genesis says multiply and be fruitful. We have to buy our fruit, you know, just like talents or whatever. But you can't, you, you can't be of every name. You, you know, you can't. And there are so many parables in the New Testament teach that very thing. Mm -hmm. That very thing. There are so many of them that teaches it. He does it in so many different ways. And I think one of the reasons why Jesus did that is because he knows just how foolish man truly is. That if given to our own devices, we're going to mess it up. I guarantee you. I guarantee you. And Jeremiah tells you what man is not capable of what? We're, we're not. We're not without God's word. Without his word, we cannot have that at all with it. It just doesn't work. We are, as followers of him, need to follow his commandments to have this joy beyond a shadow of a doubt. If we do not follow him, we will not have that joy. We can have superficial joy. You may live to be 90 year old. And you may be, you think you're the happiest, joyfulest other woman around. But when you draw that last breath, it's going to go the other way awful fast if you don't have this joy in you. If you haven't obeyed his commandments. And brother and sister's not getting on the uh, mournful or side or sad side. We're all going to pass. It's the way of man. Three scores. It's a point. Yes, it is. It is. No doubt. Three score and ten. By reason of strength, it tells us what? Four score? That's eighty. You, know, you might live longer. I hope everybody in here lives to be 110 years old. My plan is, I have 40 years like Moses out in the world. So I figure I'm going to preach for the next 40. And then I'm going to go to church for 40 more. So that must be 120. <laughs> that's, that's my plan, but I don't know about all that. It ain't in man to make his own plans, is it? No. You know, but I'm thankful that the Lord has given me the opportunity to, in some small way, get in the pulpit and, 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 and preach his word. And I strive to do that. I, I strive to preach God's word and nothing else but God's word. Now, I could tell a bunch of stories me and my brother could probably keep you as entertained for the next three or four hours and tell us stories that we could remember from the time we were all this big up to we didn't make it in. But that wouldn't do nothing that gets any good. Might get a smile or a laugh, you know, something like that out of something. Might hang your head and shame something too. But you don't have to do that when you when you preach it. And the happiest thing for me, my joy has been fulfilled so many times. 
what can I say? I can't only talk about it without wanting to cry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know. George yes. directing in a proper way. Yeah. They tell me that's part of getting old, getting emotional. Well, I guess I'm getting old because I saw I'm getting more emotional. It, it's a man's pride that keeps him from God 95% of the time. Now, he I'm has to humble himself. Thank you. Yeah. I guess we quit at 10:30.